I truly believe that outdoor education is this magical thing and it's hard for people to understand how developmental it really is. Our dream is to have everyone experience that, for everyone to know how special this is, know uh, how transformative it can be in people's lives. That's Chris Bartram talking about the effect that experiencing the great outdoors can have on people, something he sees on a daily basis as assistant director at the Maine Bound Adventure Center at the University of Maine. Outdoor recreation is a big part of many people's lives in the state of Maine, and it's now being recognized as an attractive and viable career option. I'm Ron Lisnett, and this is the Main Question Podcast. The numbers that define the economic impact of the outdoor industry are pretty staggering. Nationally, it generates around $800 billion in economic activity and creates between five and seven million jobs. In Maine, outdoor recreation generates $3 billion in economic impact. Little wonder, with the mountain ranges in the north and west of the state, vast forests, 6,000 lakes and ponds, countless rivers and streams, and the lengthy coastline giving access to the ocean. There are world-class outdoor recreation opportunities in Maine just about everywhere you turn. The College of Education and Human Development at UMaine has created a new program to take advantage of those opportunities. The Outdoor Leadership Program prepares students for careers in nonprofit, outdoor and experiential education, school-based programs, guiding, stewardship of natural resources and lands, and many other job opportunities. The program at UMaine has some great partners in this effort, including the Outdoor Recreation and Tourism Management Program at UMaine Machias, the 4-H youth camps around the state, among others. We take a deep dive into this industry, which was one of few to actually grow during the pandemic, with a round table of faculty members at both campuses and others who helped put this program together. What are students learning? Where can they take this education? What is the potential for this industry to grow in Maine and beyond? Just a few of the many areas we explore in this episode of The Main Question. Well, this is a big group we have here, and we thank you all for taking the time to talk to us. Uh, this is sounds like a great initiative going on here and, and eager to find out more about it. Since we have so many folks here, let's have each of you just quickly say your name and what your title is so people who are listening can uh, know who is who. So maybe let's start with Ryder. Hello, everyone. I'm Ryder Scott. I'm the executive director of the 4-H Camp and Learning Centers for the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. Lauren? Hey, everyone. I'm Lauren Jacobs. I'm a lecturer in outdoor leadership at the University of Maine, and I coordinate our outdoor leadership academic program. Chris? My name is Chris Bartram. I use he, him pronouns. I am the assistant director over at Maine Bound Adventure Center, the co-curricular program at the University of Maine. And Karen? Hi, I'm Karen Beeftink, and I'm a professor in the Outdoor Recreation and Leadership Program at the University of Maine at Machias. Great. Thanks all for taking the time to talk to us here. I'm not sure who to direct this question to, so whoever has the most knowledge can take it. But can you take us through the discussions and the eventual decision to start this program, this Outdoor Leadership Program? Yeah, I can start and explain where the academic program for outdoor leadership came. And it's important to recognize that even though it's new here at UMaine, there's been pieces building um, both here on our campus and certainly at UMaine Machias for a long, long time. So we had a history of having an outdoor education minor here um, in the School of Kinesiology, Physical Education, and Athletic Training. And for a number of reasons, that minor sort of didn't last, it didn't stay. It was a little bit too reliant on one individual and it sort of ended up falling apart. And so in 2017, I was hired and asked to rebuild and restructure a program. So we created the Outdoor Leadership Minor, which is uh, a 19 credit, seven course minor in outdoor leadership. And then a year after that, we got approval to add it as a concentration under the major of kinesiology and physical education. So now it's also a, a four-year degree option. And then importantly, so even though the outdoor leadership academic program is new on our campus, Karen's program at UMaine Machias has been there for a very long time and providing a 
not the exact same thing, but a similar academic program for Machaya students. And then we have a really strong history of co-curricular outdoor programs at UMaine and UMaine Machaya. So having Mainbound Adventure Center, of course, as a co-curricular program, and we're close partners in our work. Um, and then, of course, the 4-H centers as well, sort of these off-campus and often before college experience for, for younger folks. Karen, why was this the right time to do this? And what's it like now to have sort of this partnership going on? Wow, there's there's so many ways that you can answer that. It's it's the right time to do it because one COVID, oh my gosh, there's such a need now and and the whole world is kind of seeing the need for outdoors and outdoor recreation as part of people's overall health. And so any efforts to help uh, work with students to pursue careers in that direction, I think is just extremely timely right now, given given the pandemic that we're in and given the, the push for people to get outside and do activities outside and pursue these healthy activities. So I think that that the pandemic is, it kind of came along and um, it's just made this all the more timely, this collaboration. Ryder and Chris, maybe you guys can talk a little bit about painting the picture for us, the big picture in terms of the opportunities and the need for this out there in the world, so to speak. Ryder, maybe start with you. Sure. Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, we, we live in a beautiful state with unbelievable uh, outdoor recreation opportunities and natural resources. Outdoor recreation is uh, one of the only sectors of the economy in Maine that, that grew significantly throughout the, the COVID pandemic. Um, and it was already on an upward trajectory as, you know, to, to start with. It's a $3 billion industry in the state of Maine. The opportunity to uh, encourage young people in my role with the early college outdoor leadership pathway, I am, you know, really focused on steering young people to the University of Maine. Um, many of our rural kids in in the state uh, have an interest in the outdoors, but don't necessarily know that there's an opportunity to get a degree in outdoor leadership, and so helping them to find their pathway to the university is not only good for them in their own um, personal growth and higher education and career trajectory, but it also in the long term will be good for the state in supplying a a qualified workforce to contribute to that recreation economy. Chris, you were part of this industry before you came here to the university. Uh, How big is this industry and what is the trajectory, do you think? Is this a, a growing area? I'll speak in terms of climbing because climbing is my passion and where my profession has definitely been more rooted. Climbing on the whole, we're looking at in 2017, pumped $12.5 billion into the economy. So this was a fringe sport in the 90s. And now it's a $12.5 billion sport. So when you're considering that, the growth is... it's. (laughs) so significant that this is ever more the time to do it. Uh, It's, we see our students here at Mainbound and OL leaving, graduating and instantly getting jobs within the state and filling that need because of their experiences here at UMaine. So knowing how significant this growth is, is really uh, should be the driving factor for why we're doing this and for looking at the future of the industry. There's a lot of moving parts here, and I just want to make sure I understand and our our listeners understand. We have the relatively new program here at the University of Maine, and then Karen's program at UMaine Machias, and that's working together. And then Ryder, maybe you can fill in the gap in terms of, you talked about the early college program, and you work through the 4-H centers, of which there are a handful around the state. So how does that fit into all of this? Yeah, thanks, Ron, for the question. Uh, So first of all, we have uh, University of Maine Cooperative Extension operates four 4-H youth development centers. These are dynamic uh, outdoor education centers, some of which operate year round in partnership with with our local schools and our local communities. And all of them offer open enrollment outdoor and environmental education-based summer camps. So open enrollment camps for all Maine youth. Uh, Our mission is to keep those programs affordable and accessible, uh, regardless of uh, family background. 
There are lots of summer camp opportunities in Maine. Most of them are are quite expensive and out of reach for a lot of Maine families. So that's that's what we're passionate about, connecting young people to the outdoors and making those experiences um, equitable and accessible to all. Um, Several years ago, in in uh, twenty seventeen, actually, um, then Provost Hecker asked us at the four H centers to to submit a proposal um, to start an early college program, and his advice was to do what's authentic to us. And so we created the idea for an outdoor leadership early college pathway. And it just so happened that Lauren's program was getting started in around the same at around the same time, and so uh, the two of us, as well as Chris and Karen, started started meeting uh, several years ago, and really began to develop a vision for kind of a, a pre college ex- set of experiences that would then uh, create pathways to um, a four year degree. So maybe we can get a comment from each of you, uh, sort of a lightning round on this question. It's an obvious question, but why is Maine a good place to do this? And do you have a favorite spot, depending on the sport, that you just go is your go-to place? Whoever wants to go first. Oh, I see a lot of people pondering this one. Sure, I'll I'll jump in there. Um, why is Maine a good place to do this? We have incredible natural resources. Um, that just offer so many different kinds of experiences for people to participate in these ty- types of activities. So we've got lakes and rivers for paddling. We've got um, in our coastal campus here in Machias, we've got the ocean right nearby. We've got wonderful hiking trails. It's a stunning and beautiful place to be outside and to uh, encourage other people to get outside. I mean, we are vacation land, right? People come here for our natural resources and to do these activities. For me, my favorite spot is definitely the Bold Coast. I've got a very soft spot for hiking on the Bold Coast. Chris, how about you? I echo what Karen said. I'm not sure I could have much to add. I mean, I think that this is, you know, we have it all. Um, You know, I'll add from the climbing and mountaineering perspective, we have Katahdin, which is one of the only alpine mountains on the East Coast. It's super rare. And the fact that we have that home in our state is incredible. And then in addition, we have Acadia National Park, which is just a tourism center for the Northeast in so many ways. And you can go down there any weekend and see how many people are really engaging in uh, outdoor recreation in our state. But for me, I think that the place that's probably got my heart is probably Acadia. And I think that it's the special combination of the mountains and the ocean that are found there, uh, the beautiful cliffs that they have, and the amount of time that I've spent there. I have a really strong connection to this space. Now, Lauren, as I said, obvious question in Maine, as many have alluded to, have, have has so many opportunities. But for you, this is a natural fit for what you're doing for your career, right? Everyone's talked about the state as a whole, which is so which is so true. And I think uh, one of the reasons that this is so important to be part of the University of Maine system is that within that state as a whole, we have campuses in every corner of the state. And that's super unique and really amazing. So we have... Our Orono campus is is on a river with paddling literally in our front yard. Um, Karen down in Machias, Machias is on the ocean with amazing ocean side hiking and sea kayaking and river tripping in their backyard. We have campuses in Northern Maine that have amazing snowfall. We have campuses in Western Maine at the foot of the Western Maine mountains. And it just, we, so as a system, as a university of Maine system, we have amazing access to all these corners that just make this make sense this it's why this is perfect the favorite spot is is very 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 hard slash impossible um but i will say actually i have a super soft spot for a place that's really uh really close to our home here on campus and it's out at the sun Caves national wildlife refuge um in milford and it that place reminds me it's only 10, 15 minutes from campus, um, but you're way out in the middle of the woods and 
uh, this super unique peat bog environment. Um, and in the winter, you can cross country ski on the crust out on the peat bog and it's beautiful. And it reminds me that some of the best adventures are right in our backyard, that you don't have to go very far. Now, Ryder, you're based at those 4-H camps, and I, I imagine you have no shortage of great places to take the, the kids that you're dealing with uh, and many options for you, right? Yeah, we, we certainly do. And, you know, I think in answer to the question of why why Maine is a great place to do this, um, you know, I'll, I'll just say that, you know, for, again, zooming out big picture for many years, uh, we, we've been concerned in the state of Maine about a brain drain, about our, our best and brightest uh, young folks leaving the state for jobs elsewhere. I think it's really important that the University of Maine system celebrates all of the amazing uh, assets that Maine has versus trying to be something that we're not. And I think the outdoor leadership uh, program is a is a just a phenomenal example of that. And it's our it's our hope and our passion that we're um, connecting young people with those experiences. Not necessarily with the goal of keeping them in Maine, but certainly with the goal of helping them reach their fullest potential through a degree and a, and a meaningful career um, here or elsewhere. You know, in terms of my personal passion for places in Maine, certainly others have mentioned Acadia. I also have a, a deep connection and a lot of history with, um, with Mount Desert Island and and Acadia National Park. So that definitely makes the list. But more recent years, um, connecting um, groups of young folks, as well as my own family, I'd have to pick the Rangeley Lakes region. Good choice. Good good choices all, for sure. And this is maybe for the, the academic side of the, of the folks we have here uh, as you develop uh, that and try to move people into careers. What kinds of jobs and careers are we looking at? I, I think somebody mentioned writer maybe that it's a three billion dollar industry the outdoor and recreation industry in Maine so what kind of jobs are out there how many jobs are there now and and what are the needs in Maine so Lauren or Karen maybe I don't know if you that's uh, up your alley we could probably tag team this question it really varies so there the Maine outdoor brands um did a survey of their members last year and came up with some really interesting data around um what uh main outdoor brands members need and are they able to find what they need in terms of employees and um, it varies uh, everything from research and design and development to marketing skills and then also the the leading skills the the bringing people outside the service and experience providers Um, and so what we've found is we have students who are in our programs who maybe have a really clear sense of what they want to do. Maybe they want to go into commercial guiding when they're done. Maybe they want to go into conservation law enforcement when they get out of our programs. Or maybe they're not sure, but they know that they want the outdoors to be part of their lives and ideally part of their professions. And we see students graduating and going into fields where they can explore that. Um, I know I have students right now working in wilderness therapy as an example. So one particular student I have in mind did the outdoor leadership minor and a psychology major. And so she took both of those uh, programs of study and blended it into a career in wilderness therapy. It really runs the gamut from service and experience providers in either commercial or nonprofit or educational settings, um, and then more business orientation with some of the other other outdoor oriented uh, businesses, products, marketing, et cetera. But Karen, feel free to add. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'll, I'll piggyback a little bit on the, the wilderness therapy. That is definitely a growing segment and a real need, um, especially as it's been shown um, that nature is such a, a way that people can heal, um, especially with uh, particularly like veterans with PTSD and so on. Um, so that's a real growing segment. And, and we've actually since in the last couple of years, we've established a wilderness therapy minor to try and address some of those needs where it's a kind of a marriage between our psychology and community studies program and our outdoor recreation and leadership program. And then the other side of that is there's the people who are doing the leading in the commercial guiding. And then there's the people who are kind of managing the lands that people are doing the recreation on. And so that's another job need is, is we have a lot of land trusts in Maine. And so there's positions where, you know, we need people who are 
being their their job is is being a stewardship director of of a land trust or so on or um, an outreach coordinator for a land trust that helps um, fill in some of those needs of we've we've got this land and we have to maintain it so that people can use it and so these are the people behind the scenes who are helping to uh, make the plans and manage the plans and monitor the lands and make sure that the resources stay in the condition that we want them to be in so people have enjoyable recreational experiences. So I think I'm probably the oldest person here by a good bit as looking at you all. And I, I remember gym class as a kid, and for a lot of us, it didn't include any of these sports, these outdoor recreation opportunities. When and how did that change? That's part of what K through 12, some of the uh, many kids experience when they have uh, physical education, correct? Yeah, Ron, I have to correct you. Don't say gym class. You have to say physical education class. Okay. Duly noted. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I mean, so you may, um, we have a teaching coaching program that allows students to uh, get certified to be physical education teachers. And yes, um, outdoor activities and adventure activities are part of our curriculum, and we want them to be part of every student in K-12's curriculum. In different corners of the state, incorporating outdoor activities into PE has been around for quite a while, but I think it's becoming more common and becoming much more widespread. And this is actually uh, what my research focuses on and, and what my dissertation is going to be on. Um, so I could talk your ear off about this, so I'll try not to do that. But I, I will say that I think there is now so much research that demonstrates how important outdoor activities are for a mental and emotional well-being but as well as physical well-being so so children move more when they're outside and they move more vigorously when they're outside so in uh an educational era where time is of the essence and pe is often not given the time it deserves outdoor activities really provide a good bang for the buck because kids are moving more when they're doing those activities and also we have this this emphasis now on lifetime participation in physical activities so doing things in physical education class that one will be able to do forever and activities like paddling snowshoeing cross-country skiing are things that people can do their whole lives which is not not always true for some of the more traditional field and team sports and nothing against those activities but uh, typically we do not see adults doing pickup football games <laughs> that would result in a lot of injuries I, I, I'm betting Ryder, maybe you can uh, add to this a little bit, given the uh, age of the, of, the, of the kids that you deal with. We hear a lot about something called nature deficit disorder. Kids are not basically, and sort of what Lauren talked about, they're not getting outside as much as they should. Does this effort that you guys are undertaking help address that a bit? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, the, the whole topic of nature deficit disorder came from uh, an author named Richard Louvre, who published his book, Last Child in the Woods, in 2005. And uh, I, I read his book um, shortly after my first daughter was born in 2006. And, and so, you know, your question's personally meaningful to me because it, it really set me on a on a pathway of, of kind of getting serious about uh, dedicating my professional life and my career to addressing that issue. Essentially, what he says in the book is that uh, connection to the outdoors and to, to nature is not a nice to have. It's actually a, a physical, it's a necessity for physical and emotional health and wellness. Um, there's a lot of a lot of research at this point following the book. There was a vast um, you know, array of, of research and the literature is, is very, very clear and strong, um, pointing to, you know, the, the notion that, that really Louvre was right. Louvre was a journalist, not a, not a scientist, not a researcher. So he felt free to just coin this term and, you know, um, and create this, this really a, a international movement around addressing this issue that kids are not getting, connected to the natural world in ways that they were just a couple of generations ago and that it's it's you know on the one hand causing a lot of problems on the other hand if we look at it as an opportunity what we do in 4-H camp what many of Lauren's 
and Karen's students end up doing when they're in the classroom or working for nonprofit outdoor education organizations or connecting families uh, to the outdoors as guides is, you know, helping to helping to address that, helping to boost the health and wellness of our society. Chris, maybe you see this and experience this a little bit. So many kids today are buried in their phones and indoors. Kids don't even watch TV anymore, which blows my mind. You know, they're watching YouTube or looking at their phones, and everybody's going to have a, a curved neck before too long, the, the way things are going. But when kids are able to put the phone down and get out there, how, how do you see them respond to that? This is a little bit of a contentious topic in the outdoors. There's some debate as to what is the better option. Do we allow them to have phones in, during their experiences and uh, to help alleviate anxiety, or do we remove them from their devices so that they can participate completely in the experience. Um, I personally am of the fan of not having technology in our programs. And that's the stance that we take here at Mainbound. And what we hear from our students in our outdoor orientation program, Black Bear Bound, is that whether or not they were excited to give up their phone at the start of the experience, uh, by the end of the experience, they found it incredibly liberating to be disconnected from their phone. Um, it reduces their anxiety because they're not constantly checking things and uh, looking for their next notification. And that is really freeing for them. And they take that back and say, you know, I'm going to do these phone detoxes more often. I think that it's really, this is a really positive thing for me. So I think that that's what I hear most often from our participants. Maybe Karen and Lauren, you can feel this one. Can you give us maybe a thumbnail of the classes and the opportunities? You mentioned wilderness therapy. What are some of the classes? And not only are you learning a skill, but you're learning to be a leader, which works in the outdoors and works in many phases of life. So is that sort of the underlying goal of a lot of this? I would say that communication skills are pretty much at the forefront of, of our field and, um, and obviously are such a huge part of, of leadership that can really transfer to any sort of job or uh, um, any, any area of life really that somebody uh, is experiencing. So communication skills are definitely, I know, at the forefront of our program. And then we've got a lot of other you know, the leadership, there's kind of what we consider the, the hard skills of the leadership of learning of how to actually do the activities and perform the activities and then teach those activities. And then there's the softer side, they sometimes term the soft skills of facilitation, where you learn how to work well with a group and lead a group through um, doing their best to, to reach a goal or accomplish a task. And so you know, Lauren, you can jump in here, but I, I think that those are two of the, the really strong focuses uh, in, in at least my program here at Machias and I think also at yours in, in Orono. Lauren, maybe you, you could riff on that. What kinds of classes and you're trying to basically accomplish the same things that Karen's just talked about? Obviously, those same same skills are important in our courses and important for our students to demonstrate. I would add on to that um, the importance of being able to both give and receive feedback. So that becomes a really important part of all of our courses and also in our co-curricular programs as well. But but this idea of giving feedback both to participants and also maybe to co-leaders and receiving um, feedback about how we performed as facilitators and leaders. And this is an important life skill, right? So this isn't just being about about being outdoors, but it's about um, in our in our other lives in our in our professions in our school in our relationships with friends and family being able to give and receive uh, feedback is really really important I can um, chat briefly about some of our courses and and I think Karen will probably want to follow up as well in our uh, core outdoor leadership courses we have two introductory courses one is a introduction to facilitation and leadership that gives a lot of the theories and foundations of outdoor leadership and ends with a weekend um, overnight 
backcountry trip, which is actually this semester's is happening this weekend, which is very exciting. And we also have an introductory course that focuses on a lot of doing, a lot of those, what sometimes is referred to as hard skills that Karen was talking about. But we are doing the things, we are belaying, we are climbing, we are cross-country skiing, we are snowshoeing, etc. And then we have some of our higher level courses. We have Wilderness First Responder, which is also a course that Karen's program offers and is just an industry standard certification that anyone hoping to work outdoors ideally should have. We have a paddling specific course. So when, when we set about designing our program of study, we realized that paddling in Maine in a regular academic semester can be a little bit challenging, right? So we could start in the fall and feel pretty good about it, and then it gets real cold real fast. And in spring, of course, spring semester is kind of a misnomer. It's really winter semester, so very challenging. So we, do, we offer a paddling-specific course in May that allows us to capture that spring water um, and slightly warmer water temperatures, although it's still chilly. And then our program ends with a field experience course that actually Ryder and Chris teach for us, which is wonderful. So a two week intensive field experience course and where students are really taking on leadership roles related to expeditions and instruction. And another course that we teach that I love and is actually super accessible, it's the only online course we have, is Ethics and Social Justice and Outdoor Leadership. So this course, we decided right from the beginning, needed to be part of the curriculum. We we thought about, should it just be part of every course, or do we want a standalone course? And in the end, we decided we wanted a, a standalone course to really give this topic the credit that it deserves. And so that's a that's also a really fun, fun course for us. Ryder, maybe you could talk a little bit about, we're talking with uh, Lauren and, and Karen about students that have decided to pursue this for their academic careers, but you're dealing with a, a, a bit of a younger uh, cohort of, of kids. So maybe you could talk about the programs and how that feeds into potentially a kid coming out of high school and deciding to pursue outdoor leadership as a, as a career. Yeah, absolutely. We're working with youth ages, uh, you know, roughly seven through 17 in our 4-H camp programs, as well as our, our school-based K-12 programs in the, in the school year. Um, but we also hire a tremendous number of staff um, seasonally, particularly in the summer, um, you know, in, in like, let's say 2019 numbers, we, we hired 150 seasonal staff across the 4-H centers. So I'm seeing it at both ends. I'm seeing young professionals coming out of universities uh, who are working in the field in some cases for the first time and in other cases um, they're applying for year-round jobs with us in leadership roles, et cetera, developing these pathways through, um, first of all, 4-H camp experiences that develop, you know, create that spark and develop that passion for the outdoors and for you know potentially seeing, for a young person to see themselves in those teaching and leadership roles in the future is is really, really important. Another piece we haven't discussed really at all is micro-credentialing. So we, we have developed through 4-H and the U- University of Maine system, we have developed the first youth digital badge in outdoor leadership. And we've started to administer that digital badge. It has a set of criteria, um, levels one through three, um, that a young person can aspire to, to meet. That's just one more credential, one more you know, sort of step in the pathway towards a degree and a career in this field. So for Lauren and Chris here in Orono and Karen at Machias, right on campus here, on bo- both campuses, there are plenty of places to, to do these kinds of things. Maybe you could talk about the facilities or the opportunities that are just right outside the doors here of uh, the campus in Orono and Machias. Uh, you can have your classes and just step right out and, and go right to town, right, Lauren? Yeah, we can. We have trails, we have the river that we can access right from campus. And I'll let Chris talk a little bit about the Mainbound facilities specifically, because um, we have this amazing resource resource through Mainbound. Lauren mentioned the trails. We have 150 miles of trails here when you count the greater Bangor area, which is, I am constantly astonished by that number. There's a map that was published recently that kind of details all of those trails and 
from mountain biking to cross country skiing, snowshoeing, hiking, walking, whatever it is, there's just so much there. And then, yeah, we have these beautiful rivers. We also have uh, climbing areas that are only just down the road in Clifton, 25 or 30 minutes away, which is a resource that not many colleges have the privilege to be so close to. And then right here on campus, Mainbound has a climbing gym. Uh, it's a small gym in, a, in our barn uh, that serves over 12,000 students a year. Uh, so we have uh, a lot of people coming in and out. We also have this beautiful challenge course that is uh, tucked into the trails behind the recreation center here. And both of those uh, definitely serve the co-curricular program and outdoor leadership in a big way. Karen, you're right in the middle of all, all kinds of uh, great places to explore down there in Machias. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in, and even right on our campus, I'm actually looking outside at the trail that, um, that we have that that's on our campus and uh, and part of our projects with the students is actually working on developing and maintaining those trails. So I was just out, just last hour, I was out with a, with a class doing some, some trail measurements and looking at trail width and trail slope. And, um, and it's great because we don't even have to leave the campus. We're right there. And then just down the road, we've got access to tidal waters. We can put in right in, right in town there's a boat launch and we can access tidal waters um, to go canoeing or kayaking. We've got the Gold Coast super nearby, which is fantastic for hiking. And we've got so many rivers and lakes that it's like, which one am I going to take my class to today for, you know, to go paddling? It's a lovely problem to have when you're like trying to decide which one you want to go to and, and you're having a hard time making up your mind because they're all so nice. Good problem to have for sure. And finally, as we wrap up here, just we ask this at the end of a lot of uh, podcasts where we talk to folks, if you sort of project out five or 10 years, wh where does where is all this going to lead? What, what do you hope to see? What, what do you think you'll see as as this develops and, and moves into the future? Let's start with uh, let's start with Ryder. Uh, not to uh, contradict you, Ron, I just kind of tagged Lauren to maybe lead off on that just because La Lauren has been super articulate in a in a sort of a vision for the state and the humane system in this. So I'll, I'll be happy to riff off of her. OK, Lauren. What do I envision and hope for the future? I hope for the future that every child growing up in Maine has access to meaningful outdoor experiences um, throughout their childhood and lives, and that they have uh, skilled and passionate adult leaders to bring them outdoors. And in order for that vision to come true, I think that's where we all come in at the University of Maine and the University of Maine system. Um, we have the opportunity to train our next guides and leaders and educators that will be getting those kids and parents too <laughs> that will be getting those kids outside. There's no one way to do that but this mix of co-curricular opportunities, academic opportunities, as well as uh, opportunities throughout the lifetime from childhood through adolescence and into adulthood. These are all ways that we can help shape that future for Maine. Um, and I'm sure that my colleagues have some other things to add on to that. I guess well, I'd add in um, that that we're also helping s kids and students develop those skills to not only how to do these activities, but how to do them in a way that has a minimum impact on the natural resources so that these natural resources remain in the condition that we, we want them to stay in. So we can continue to, to be this wonderful place that everyone wants to come and visit in the summer. And we can continue to get all of these health and wellness benefits that being outside affords us. Ryder, what do you think all these efforts, where do you hope they and think they'll lead? I'm going to back up even a little bit and just say, 40 years ago, uh, Tanglewood 4-H camp was was founded um, with on the on the premise and, and with the mission that uh, that outdoor experiences and, and connection to the incredible, you know, beauty, natural beauty that Maine has to offer should not be solely for the, the children and families of the privileged. They should be for all Maine youth. And fast forward 40 years later, we have we now have a robust network of 
4-H camps and then expand that out outward to include all of these folks and all of the other programs at the the other UMaine system campuses that Lauren mentioned. And we actually, we have the infrastructure and the, the people and the team in place now to really fulfill that vision that, that Lauren just laid out. Chris, we'll give you the final word. I am obviously biased, but I truly believe that outdoor education is this magical thing. And it's hard for people to understand how developmental it really is, right? Uh, Mainbound is part of student life. Um, so we're housed under student life and campus recreation. And we take that developmental piece to heart. And we know that the students that are participating in our programs and in outdoor recreation opportunities are having these life-changing experiences. They know that after the experience that they have on an outdoor orientation program or in a class that is field-based, they're coming out slightly different person and they don't can't quite put their finger on it that's why we call it magic because it truly is our dream is to have everyone experience that to have everyone have that opportunity for everyone to know how special this is know uh, how transformative it can be in people's lives well after talking to you all i, I want to get outdoors right now so let's uh let's hope we can all do that very soon and thank you all for uh, sharing your stories with us Thank you. Thanks so much, Ron. Thanks for joining us. To find out more about the program at UMaine, head to the College of Education and Human Development page at umaine.edu. For info on the program at UMaine Machias, head to machias.edu slash tourism. And to learn more about Cooperative Extension's 4-H summer camps for kids, go to extension.umaine.edu slash 4-H slash camps. The main question can be found on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, UMaine's Facebook and YouTube pages, and now on Amazon Music and Audible. Get in touch with any questions or comments at mainquestion at maine.edu. This is Ron Lisnett. We'll catch you next time on The Main Question.